Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Cultures um, Speaker Series. I am Brian Ray. I'm the Vice Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the event today. Um, we're going to begin today with um, an Indigenous land affirmation, um, and I will begin. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationships with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. It is my great pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Mike Anani, who is an Associate Professor of Communications and Journalism and Affiliated Faculty of Science, Technology and Society at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communications and Journalism, where he studies the public significance of digital infrastructures, journalistic practices and algorithmic systems. He co-directs the interdisciplinary USC Collective Media as Sociotechnical Systems, or MASTS, and the Sloan Foundation project, Knowing Machines. He is the author of Network Press Freedom, co-editor of uh, Bauhaus Futures, and publishes in various interdisciplinary domains, including journalism studies, science and technology studies, and critical internet studies. He holds a PhD from Stanford University, a master's from MIT Media Laboratory, and has held fellowships and visiting professorships with um, Stanford University Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, Columbia University's Tau Center, the Ber Bergren uh, Institute, the Trudeau Foundation, and the University of Helsinki. He writes, he regularly writes for popular press publications, including The Atlantic, Wired Magazine, Harvard's Neiman Lab, and the Columbia Journalism Review. Professor Anani, it is a pleasure to have you join us today. And the title of the talk is Seeing Like an Algorithm Error, What Are Algorithmic Mistakes? Why Do They Matter? And How Might They Be Public Problems? Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you for getting up very early. I know it's eight o'clock in, uh, in Los Angeles. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a it's a total treat to be here and just uh, triple checking that everybody can hear my my audio fine if that's okay um, and see the slides. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a it's a total treat. And as I was saying in the introduction, I, I grew up in Ottawa and uh, I'm sort of there in spirit and I appreciate the chance to to be with you all at least uh, virtually this morning. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here. What I would love to to um, do today is sort of tell a story in three parts. And this is a story that's related to this idea of what happens when algorithms fail? What happens when algorithms make mistakes? What constitutes a mistake? What even gets to count as a mistake? And then specifically, what can we learn about public problems and how investments in public problems are made if we focus on these algorithmic mistakes and trying to understand them and trace them from as many different perspectives as possible. Um, so today what I want to do is, um, as I say, tell this uh, sort of set up what I mean by algorithms as objects of study of error or for error tell three stories, and I'll sort of get into the stories as quickly as I as I can, um, and then try to hopefully leave you with a bit of a, a takeaway message of what it means to think about algorithmic errors as public problems. So without further ado, I won't get, I won't review uh, all this slide. There's way too much on there, but I just leave it up in case people uh, want to sort of see where I'm coming from. But I really follow, uh, Tarleton Gillespie, I think many years ago, had this wonderful uh, definition of algorithms as these things that are beyond simply a computational description, they have the power to enable and assign meaningfulness, to, to manage how information is perceived by people, and what he called this, quote, this distribution of the sensible. Um, and that expansiveness, that broadness is what I bring to this, uh, this question that I have. And we know, and I'm sure many people uh, in the crowd know, that algorithms are everywhere. You know, when I've, when I've talked about them many years ago, you had to sort of make the case that algorithms were all over the place. Um, now, I don't think that's as, as true. Um, they're everywhere from 
sort of how the social web is structured to how money flows to how labor is compensated to how uh, risk and human security is configured they they really are everywhere and i can go through in q a sort of more of that claim but that's i i think sort of the basis that i come at it with and getting a little bit more um uh detailed i i sort of try to develop this definition of algorithms using science and technology studies, a sort of socio-technical system view of what algorithms are. And this is a little bit of a clunky definition that doesn't exactly roll off your tongue. Um, but I think about algorithms as these assemblages of institutionally situated code, practices, norms, and all of these things intersect with sort of this power to create and sustain and signify relationships not just among people, but among people and data. And then the last component of the of the uh, definition is through these minimally observable semi-autonomous actions. There's sort of a, a there be dragons, we're not sure how the system works quality to the function of algorithms that's going to come in play uh, when we talk about algorithmic errors and mistakes. So sort of, if you can keep this definition in mind, this expansive de definition of algorithms and what they are. Um, but for today, what I want to focus on sort of these three questions. The first is, where exactly are algorithmic errors? I sometimes think there's sort of a, a rush to, um, you know, be, be outraged or be um, upset with the products of algorithms that don't comport with our expectations, our being a very uh, loaded term there, who the we is. Um, but so I'm curious about saying, getting some precision about where people think algorithmic errors are exactly. And the follow on question to that is, they can become these sort of diagnostics of people's investments. Where do people want algorithmic errors to be? Where do they see errors? Where do they see breakdowns happening? Because um, not everybody agrees on where the algorithm has broke down or even if it's broken down, as you'll see a little bit later. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what do uh, or how do accounts of harms drive fixes? So even if people agree that there is an error, there might be a lot of disagreement about whether there was a harm that was made or where that harm is or how that harm is distributed. But we can start to sort of ask questions about investments in people um, and values and normative systems if we start to get precision around algorithmic errors. So I, as I mentioned, I sort of draw from science technology studies that's sort of the literature that I'm coming from which is a field that has sort of thought about and um, focused on, on error type situations in a lot of different ways. Bowker and Starr's notion of an infrastructural inversion is pretty key, turning an infrastructure inside out to see how it works, how it breaks down. Um, this notion of normal accident, Charles Perot's uh, answer, or Diane Vaughn's study of the Challenger um, explosion, um, things that are organizationally situated, breakdowns or glitches or collapses. Uh, we've also got a lot of good work thinking about what a controversy is and how some errors and breakdowns and failures <clears throat> drive socio-technical controversies or give us ways of starting to think about um, what should the world of socio-technical systems look like. Um, and then I also draw and think a lot about uh, Steve Jackson's really great work on broken world thinking um, and his collaborator Cindy Lin at Penn State University, who's also done a lot of more recent thinking on this. So the science technology studies has sort of a deep bench of, I think, thinking about it. Um, but what I, what I still see um, uh, sort of could use some some emphasis in that literature is to sort of apply almost a sort of a Foucauldian genealogical analysis to algorithmic errors and start to see that there is no such thing as one definition of the error or one perspective on what an error is. It's partly in how infrastructures um, misalign or break down. It's partly in normativities or sort of normative investments that not everyone shares, not everyone agrees on the significance or the um, social power of a breakdown. And then I, the last story I'll tell is this uh, story of, I think institutions could reflect on and think about themselves in the algorithmic errors that they are responsible for or that they tend to be uh, homes for. So I'll, I'll tell three stories that are specifically related to these three different ways of seeing algorithmic errors as infrastructures that break down, <clears throat> as normativities that are not shared or that are in collision in some way, and as institutions that are struggling with their responsibility for either identifying or fixing algorithmic errors. And then if I, if I get time, if I manage my time properly, um, we'll think about uh, how all of these three ways of seeing algorithmic errors could 
uh, suggests some ways of thinking about errors as public problems. As and I, I uh, acknowledge, I'm sort of a coming from a, a Dewey perspective of thinking about public problems are things that are shared consequences that no matter how much money or access or privilege that you might have, you cannot extract yourself from a public problem. Think about climate change, think about clean water, clean air, healthcare, public education. These are all systems that are public systems. So what can algorithmic errors teach us about public systems? So I'd like to, to sort of land on and think about. Um, okay, so I wanna tell, start with my first story. Um, <clears throat> so, if in 2008, in September 2008, you had gone to Google News and you had typed in United Airlines into the search box, pretty standard uh, action, this would be the top story that you would have gotten returned for that search query. And this was a story uh, that was published in the sunsentinel.com. You can see in the top left corner there. Um, it was also Iran and the Chicago Tribune because of the relationship that they had. But this was a story. Um, about United Airlines filing for bankruptcy. And this story talked about how the United Airlines need protection from its creditors. Um, they needed to reposition airplanes. They needed to think about uh, their relationship to the unions and staff uh, issues that were coming up. It was sort of a detailed description of how much money they were losing and why that money mattered and what and what United was doing to, to fix um, or to, to try to move on from the bankruptcy. So this was 2008. So you went to Google news, you typed in United Airlines, 2008, this is the top story that you would get. Um, this story, uh, the only problem is that this is actually a story from 2002. So this was a six-year-old story that would be shown to you as the top story on Google News when you would search for United Airlines. And it was it was a six-year-old story. It, it was still a true story. It was a story that was true six years ago, but I'd argue that it was not sort of the how Google News thinks of itself as operating or how uh, people expect Google News to operate. So let me tell you the story of where, how did this happen? So this was an algorithmic error in a sense, but I wanna argue that it was an infrastructurally constructed algorithmic error. So this story from um, the Chicago Tribune. So here's here's, this was a story that was produced um, by the Chicago Tribune, Sun Sentinel has an organizational partnership. What happened was that um, there's also a stringer for Bloomberg News, who in 2008 um, had as one of his companies that he had to cover United Airlines. So very reasonable thing that stringers do when they're often having to cover you know, five or six stories a day, produce them quickly on uh, tight deadlines. So this stringer for Bloomberg News sort of wakes up and says, well, United Airlines is one of my companies I'm supposed to be uh, covering. What's going on with United Airlines today? Goes to Google News to see what might be happening. Um, sees this story coming up as the top story for United Airlines, this six-year-old story. He doesn't notice that it's a six-year-old story, of course. He just sees that it's the top story. He then ends up filing a story for Bloomberg News because th he thinks he's got a scoop. He thinks, oh, the sunsentinel.com story, nobody's covering it. He thinks he has a scoop. He files a story for Bloomberg News, which is very large, uh, you know, mostly financial uh, wire service that a lot of different companies and news organizations subscribe to. He files this story. That gets picked up by uh, many news organizations. And then what ends up happening is that um, uh, financial trading algorithms are also uh, constructed or, or financial trading algorithms are depending upon their automatic analysis of news stories. So financial trading algorithms start behaving as if United has filed for bankruptcy, even though it was six years ago. Um, and to give away a little punchline of sort of how did this happen, if you could scroll to the very bottom of the screen, you can't. Um, the, what happened was at the very bottom of this story by sunsentinel.com, that's where you see the 2002 date for this story about United Airlines filing for bankruptcy. It was just a decision that sunsentinel.com made was to put the story for, or the date for the individual stories at the very bottom, but they would put at the top left of the screen, they would put the today's date of the issue date. A relatively mundane sort of boring, you know, decision about where to put date on a story. But what ended up happening was it tricked the Google crawler. The Google crawler made a mistake. The Google crawler did not read the date that was at the bottom of this story. The Google crawler read the date that was at the top of the mass page for sunsentinel.com and thought that 
all of these stories um, were were recent or were new. So you might say, sir, okay, well, why does this matter, right? So, but remember back to these financial trading algorithms that are parsing this news, the Bloomberg Stringer who uh, is trying to quickly file a story. He writes this story for Bloomberg News. So this is what ends up happening to United Airlines stock price. So it drops about 75% for no good reason that anyone can sort of discern in this moment. United's uh, CEO at that time is, is apoplectic, is not happy at all. Um, United's unions are, are wondering what's up, Stock shareholders are wondering what's up. What ended up happening was that you had this sort of perfect storm, and this is what I wanna sort of unpack is this first story of error. You had this sort of perfect storm of a bunch of seemingly boring things that came together in this socio-technical assemblage of error to produce this outcome that could be observed. So the only reason we really knew there was an error is really because of this, the stock drop, this, the, the price um, uh, dropping. That was, uh, and keep it in mind later on, uh, Andy Lakoff calls this a, quote, sentinel device. These are sort of systems or devices that are, we are able to show us that there's a problem or are watching for a particular problem. So if I think about the anatomy of this story, of how this is sort of a story of infrastructural breakdown as a story of algorithmic error, you've got a few things going on here. One is just sort of this relatively boring date representation issue. Like why put it at the top versus the bottom? Seemingly small, innocuous design decision, but it it kind of tricked Google crawler, Google crawler uh, crawling the web, making assumptions about where dates would be, what was recent, what's new, what's good to um, highlight. You've got these organizational partnerships kind of lurking in the background. You've got this relationship between the Chicago Tribune and the Sun Sentinel and Bloomberg News and the financial trading algorithms that are automatically parsing Bloomberg News. You've got journalistic practices in terms of um, you know, the stringer who's understandably trying to do their work uh, quickly and on deadline, a stringer that had more time to sort of track this down and say, wait a second, you know, do I really have a scoop here? And you know, may have made a different decision. We've also got you search habits of users. So we know that most people do not go past you know, the first few hits of Google News. There's good evidence to, um, to show there's eye tracking studies actually to show where people's eyes go on these search results. We know that most people are sort of focused on those top few results. Um, we've also got this sort of automaticity between the news stories and the trading algorithms as well. Sort of those are making assumptions about what current is um, and what correct means. Um, but the last bit I want to sort of uh, focus on here, this sort of these observable consequences. This is a case, in a way, it's almost the easiest case of error because it's the easiest to see. Um, and you've got an explicit apology. You know, uh, Google ends up apologizing, but doesn't actually say um, really what happened. They just sort of say this was a glitch. This was an error, but don't worry that we fixed it. So anyway, so I want you to keep that story in mind. This is the first story of error, in a sense, um, is this error in these infrastructural relationships and it's you can start to say error is kind of everywhere here it's kind of all over this but it's triggered by a particular moment um so keep that story in mind this is sort of story number one story number two is is kind of a different story and the the backstory here so for folks who don't know uh grinder is a location-based app uh mostly for men looking to have sex with men but also as we have worked by jeremy bernholtz or jed brubaker and a bunch of other people looking at location-based apps. Grindr is a place where a lot of other activity happens. It's not just a hookup app. Um, it's a app where people and to experiment with identity work, try to figure out sort of geographically uh, situated identities and communities who might be around, who is, you know, like me or unlike me, and sort of how to build community um, for LGBTQ people who are perhaps sort of questioning identity or trying to figure out where their local uh, geographic community might be. So there's a lot going on in Grindr, and I can point to, to research uh, that really nicely shows that later. But um, so when I was a postdoc at Microsoft Research, this is many years ago now, but um, we were given uh, for a workshop, we were asked to install a whole suite of apps on a brand new phone, partly to sort of see how uh, what the experience was like um, installing apps on a brand new phone that supposedly knew nothing about us. And uh, one of the apps that I was asked to install was Grindr. So got the got the phone, went to Google Play Store. So Google Play Store was the um, the store with the app store at the time. That's what it was called. Um, went to Google Play Store to install uh, Grindr as onto the phone. And this is what I saw. So this is and look, look at the bottom left hand corner here is these are the top related apps. And again, this is 2011. So it's a while ago now, but um, but I think it's still uh, 
uh, illustrate something. So in the bottom left-hand corner, this is what Android was saying were the top related apps for Grindr. And the top related app was this app called Sex Offender Search. So just by the way, this all of these screenshots come from, I was uh, screenshotting and sort of uh, building up a corpus or taking this, this data in um, as this story unfolds. If you look at the top, I sort of tried to give a timeline to sort of show how the story unfolds, but I was gathering this data as I went. So took a screenshot of this as uh, Sex Offender Search being the top related app that's there. So what is sex offender search? Sex offender search, and this is their language um, at the time, they described themselves as, quote, sex offender search keeps your family protected by letting you know where sex offenders are in your neighborhood. This app uses the most up-to-date information from the National Sex Offender Registry. What it was or what it is is an app that would let you sort of uh, almost sort of Google Maps style uh, show your little blue dot and it would use this uh, national registry for people who had been convicted of sex offenses, sex offender offenses, um, who had to register and give their addresses. It would let you navigate through the city or through an area in a way that avoided or, or uh, knew about those addresses. But the whole premise of this app was that uh, they would help you avoid that. There's there's a separate story to tell in the US, especially about sort of the problematic and complicated nature of that registry and how this is not an easy um, uh, sort of or, or neat story to tell. But for this story, it doesn't totally matter. But just keep in mind that that, that sex offender registry um, is complicated and problematic in particular ways. But anyway, so this was the top related app that was said was related to Grindr. And if you remember my introduction of saying Grindr, there's a lot else going on on Grindr. It's not just a hookup app. There's a lot else going on. So I saw this, uh, this association uh, was sort of had a mixture of curiosity about how this recommendation was um, produced and also sort of a sense of normative offense of saying, this is not right, that sex offender search should be the top related app to Grindr. Um, there's a more complicated story to tell here. So I did, a, in the time, I did this thing where I just wrote a, an article for The Atlantic. I, I was lucky enough to have access to be able to do that and sort of wrote this. This article is still up if you want to read it, but uh, wrote it to sort of try to reflect on what this association was and what it meant. And I remember this is the early days of, of sort of algorithmic thinking or thinking about algorithms as socio-technical systems. So I wrote this uh, article thinking about, you know, if you're uh, a questioning, you know, kid, especially in a sort of rural area, and you were to install Grinder as a way to sort of try to figure out your community around you, and you saw that sex offender search come up as the top related app, um, what kind of harm would that be doing? Or what kind of message would that be sending about the identity work that you were trying to do? Um, so anyway, I wrote this article for The Atlantic. Um, it got, you know, reasonably picked up, and but I sort of thought that was the end of the story. It was not the end of the story. So what ended up happening is I wrote the startup related. Uh, Google reached out to me. This is a redacted version of the email that I got from Google. Um, so this person from Google says, hey, Mike, my name is blank, um, and I do communications for Android. I saw your article in the Atlantic about the Android market, and I wanted to reach out to hopefully provide some info on the related apps feature, how it works, et cetera. Let me know if you have time for a quick chat. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I, I sort of made a time to talk with this person from um, communications group at Android. Um, but in the meantime, I was sort of um, watching things a little unfold. It was sort of my 15 minutes of small world uh, fame as this Atlantic article was sort of um, picked up a few places. I was also refreshing the um, related apps uh, uh, section for Grindr because I was, so I wrote a little script to sort of refresh this uh, page and see if it was changing at all. It was changing. We Later on, this is about three days later, we saw uh, instead of sex offender search, it now listed uh, Scruff and Adam for Adam that are sort of arguably apps that are more uh, in, uh, similar to Grindr definitely than sex offender search. They're sort of consider themselves competitor apps or there's uh, peer apps in a way. So we saw this curious thing happening where the related apps were actually changing. The related feature was changing. This was not a static, stable thing. It was shifting for some reason. In the meantime, this Atlantic article gets picked up. I start getting a whole bunch of you know emails and and uh, messages and messages left on stories. Um, I don't recommend this as a small world famous moment. It's uh, a lot of messages that were not fun to to read or to receive, but sort of a lot of 
uproar or sort of, uh, you know, visceral reaction to this story that was there, but I was sort of tracking that and building this corpus that I'll talk about a little bit later. I then refreshed the screen again. We were, I was refreshing it constantly to see what it was like. Um, no apps were were listed as related at this point. For some reason, the, all the apps were gone. So we went from sex offender search to peer apps to no apps at all. And then I got to talk to the Google person. I got to have this conversation with the person who did communications for Android. Um, I, I have a you know, an undergraduate in computer science, I've spent time writing code, I've spent time sort of trying to make systems work. I have a decent understanding of the broad ideas of how data structures and algorithms work. I'm not a, you know, a great computer scientist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I was curious what this Google marketplace person was going to tell me because, you know, they said they were going to tell me how the system works. And I was curious to hear what the explanation would be. Um, and especially what the explanation would be for this association. So I started, I was taking notes. Uh, I was building by now sort of a corpus, a mini case study. So what uh, this person told me was that app features are extracted, they're weighted, they're aggregated through a proprietary and dynamic algorithm. So there's sort of a neutral process that's happening. And as a, you know, somebody with at least some computer science training said, I was sort of not intrigued or interested by this um explanation. I was like, yeah, of course, that's how it works. It's not, that's not helping me understand how this association was made. That's sort of a generic description of, you know, of how semantic uh, text-based um, uh, similarities are, are computed or are calculated. That's not necessarily rocket science in a way. Um, what he was, was curious though, is as our conversation went on, he wanted to stress with me and say that, the, well, what happened was what you saw was that there was a bug in the weightings. The weightings were changed. That's what we did. He said, the weightings were changed, but quote, this was like, I was taking copious notes, careful notes. He said, quote, the engineer did not change the algorithm. And I was intrigued by that because I was like, wow, that's interesting. Where is this algorithm? And he said, well, you know, nobody really understands this algorithm. There isn't necessarily one person responsible. There, so this claim that sort of the engineer did not change the algorithm, this mythical engineer working alone in a room, we know that's not how they, these work. These are uh, dynamic and uh, probabilistic sort of socio-technical systems that are drawing on different data sources, different forms of human judgment. They're not stable in the way that you can have an engineer just go and uh, change the algorithm. This is what he sort of was saying was, we actually were not sure how it works. So for me, there was this moment where I was like, where is this algorithm? Where is this thing? Um, how has it been constructed? How has it been made into an object that can be so unstable and yet at the same time so seemingly neutral and objective um, and, and but still make mistakes? Um, so I ended up having this sort of falling into, I don't recommend this as it's, it wasn't a you know carefully designed methodological research study and a case study. And that point, I ended up sort of falling into um, a corpus of materials comments on the uh, on the articles, a bunch of emails that I got, my conversation, a, a follow-up conversation with Google, making this up, seeing this. And it sort of led me to some questions that were sort of motivating this, this broader project of where do people think this algorithm is? How did it make a mistake? Why do people think it made a mistake? And what I ended up doing was getting these comments. So I want to give you a sense of the themes that I got across these comments and emails that I, that I received. <clears throat> And some of this, I, I, I warn, is a little uh, sort of, I would say, uh, offensive and disturbing. But anyway, this is this is the sense of the themes that I got. So what, uh, this is a direct quote from somebody who said, commenter who said, I don't quote, I don't see why anybody should be the least surprised that this association was made. It's simple. Both apps relate to sexual deviants and perverts. Another quote. Quote, I've never heard of this app before. Get somebody in your life and these things become non-issues. Quote, if two apps are related, isn't that based on people's actions and therefore indicative that people who view or install one app also view or install the other? So you start to see these little folk theories appearing in how people think uh, both the uh, algorithms work and sort of what's going on behind the association. Another quote, quote, I would guess that both apps are tagged as being primarily focused on geographic searches for sexually related information. One normal, healthy, and social grinder, very different contrast from the first theme, first uh, quote, um, the other aberrant, sick, and criminal sexual predation. This also does not leave room for this sex offender registry uh, to be considered something that's problematic and more complicated than simply that, that summary. So still a lot of complexity here to unpack. 
Finally, a uh, person has a theory of, of uh, morality and computers and says, personally, I'd see, ah, two geolocative apps grouped together. I honestly would not presume any moral link because computers don't see morality. So how could they make any such association? So what I saw in these sort of these themes and these experiences and the interviews and the, the, um, the content analysis and how the apps were changing, the recommendations were changing, people definitely have folk theories of algorithms. And a lot of people have written about that uh, phenomenon for sure, what they are. But I was also seeing that people have folk theories of algorithmic failure. And I started to try to organize this uh, a little more systematically of saying, where do you think the algorithm is? Where do you think the association exists? And what do you need to do if you think there's a problem? What do you need to do to quote, fix this algorithm? What's, what's, the, what's the remedy um, to this error in, in if you think the algorithm is in a particular place and the association is in a particular place? So here's the sort of typology or the sort of model that I was, that I was playing with and, and trying to build up. So one view says the algorithm, and think about that first uh, comment of the, the themes, one view is to say the algorithms are sort of mirrors of reality, that algorithmic associations are just true, that they capture something, they're just a mirror on what's going on. And the association exists in their sort of these social and cultural values, but it's it's by definition correct in a sense because that's just what the society is or the cultural values are doing. So if you want to quote fix this algorithm, it's actually more about engaging people in the beliefs and the values that they hold and saying, no, no, you know, maybe, maybe that mirror of reality is not the one that we we want, but it's sort of, it, it leaves the algorithm a little out of the story in some ways, but that's where, that's sort of one way of thinking about it. Um, another way to think about it is that almost a little sort of more computational, and this is perhaps sort of seemed like Google's view and the engineer's view for sure, is to say that the algorithm reflects what people do, what they click on, what they download, it's sort of their traces, their actions, and this is just the algorithm as a computational aggregation of practices. So the association exists in sort of these monitored traces of what individuals do, and it's this neutral calculator. So if you want to, quote, fix that algorithm, then what you got to do is make a technical intervention to fix how that aggregation is working, how that calculation is working. That's where the fix would happen for the algorithm. It's not necessarily in engaging the social cultural values. It's about fixing the system that's there. A final way to think about it, and that's just in the interest of a typology, is to say some people sort of saw this algorithm as it's this sort of weird and unfortunate um, sort of product at how systems as large as the internet and as, as sort of socially technically intertwined as the internet, that's where the quote the algorithm is. So the association exists. You can't point to it any one place in particular, but it's going to be in partly the computational code, partly people's actions, partly their perceptions. But the, if you want to fix it, you've got to sort of engage with those relationships between the human and the non-human, the people and the data, the data structures and the institutional values that think those data structures should be designed in a particular way. But that's where you would go to fix the algorithm as you engage in that, in that relational uh, work that's there. Um, so the point here is to, to sort of think about um, the normativities that would drive an algorithmic error or think about how what people think either counts or doesn't count as a problem to engage to be fixed, that's where you could think about it. In a little bit in contrast to the infrastructural um, uh, construction of the algorithmic error that I talked about with United Airlines, this one was sort of a place that said, well, you've got to have some view about what you think the National Sex Offender Registry is doing or what you think uh, the computer's view on morality would be. Um, so with those two sort of two stories in mind, I want to turn to the third and final story. And that's a story that uh, for many people who are in universities, you're probably very familiar with or you've seen this phenomenon of these um, electronic proctoring systems or these sort of systems that would monitor students as they were taking uh, timed exams that would effectively supervise them while they were taking exams in a way that was meant to mimic the exams that uh, they could not take. So in March 2020, at least in my university and many, many other universities, um, when we went, you know, quote, went online um, as the COVID-19 was, was uh, gaining strength in our part of the world, um, that our university said, well, we were going to use these systems to do timed evaluations um, and try to mimic the 
uh, exam proctoring that we would do in place. So lots of companies um, sort of doing similar things, ExamSoft, Proctorio, ProctorU, Respondus. Um, in a sense, they, the company themselves is not what I want to focus here. I don't want to focus on any one particular company, but there's this phenomenon of trying to monitor students as they're taking exams. And the way this so software system would work is it you know, would lock down your browser for sure, so it wouldn't let you go other places. It would pay attention to you know, the audio in the room where you were taking the exam. It would uh, use your camera <clears throat> on your laptop to track where your head was so that you weren't you know, looking up because you know answers could be on the ceiling or you weren't looking to the side because uh, somebody could be giving you the answers off screen. Um, you also you know, couldn't be whispered an answer because the audio, um, the microphone would be monitoring whether there were any audio there. The whole point was to try to sort of lock the person in as much as possible into this state that could be observed, that could be surveilled, so that um, any questions of academic integrity or any breaches of sort of uh, academic integrity could be detected by the software. Um, the software is using you know, machine learning techniques to on data sets of, you know, what it means, you know, what does a face look like? What is sound sound like? What is suspicious keyboard tapping look like? Um, the, the whole point was to sort of create an image of a test taker that uh, could be built, built as a model so that you could detect cheating, essentially. Um, so what was happening here was that we've got this moment where we were going online and we're trying to sort of figure out how to move standardized evaluation onto these, you know, these in some ways wonderfully convenient surveillance tools that students had with them with webcams, with microphones, with keyboards that could be tracked. Um, there was also a desire to sort of, I would say, sort of align with existing practices. So there were, uh, true at our university and I'm sure at many others as well, a lot of very large classes that depended on timed supervised exams. If you're teaching, you know, introduction to calculus and the, there's 300 students in the class, um, there's kind of only probably, you know, one type of test that you're going to give at a certain point in the semester every year. And it's a pretty standardized kind of thing at that point. Um, that's, you know, probably different from, you know, a poetry class or a history class where you're, you're thinking about producing essays. But anyway, there was a, a type of class that relied on these types of practices. There are also concerns about sort of evaluation equality of trying to make it so that students, you know, we, we didn't have some uneven distribution of academic violations. There was also a concern um, of sort of professorial autonomy. So we, in our university as well, we, we try really hard not to tell professors exactly how to evaluate students. That's part of sort of a principle of academic freedom of letting people design the evaluation mechanisms that work for them. Um, and as I say, you've got these domain specific traditions of things that you know, would work in, in chemistry or calculus wouldn't necessarily work as well uh, in humanities or some social sciences. And you also had this concern among the universities that there was sort of this brand protection problem as you went online at a moment when we weren't sure how long the online component was going to be. Um, there was a concern of, you know, what did it mean to get a degree from a online you know, a university that had rapidly gone online. Um, was that degree just as good quality as some other degree um, where the students have been doing in-person testing? So you ended up getting these sort of use of these software, but also this backlash against the software. You got these um, concern of students saying, wait a second, I've been, you know, accused of cheating by this software that I've never met. And I don't get to know my professor because it's not like the professor can judge a situation in a moment and sort of make a reasonable determination, there's sort of this software layer that's trying to make a decision about uh, whether an academic violation has happened. And I should hasten to say, all of these companies in their materials say, we're not the ones trying to decide that a student has cheated. All we're doing is flagging anomalous events and we're letting faculty or universities decide that that constitutes an academic um, violation. So the, the companies are saying, we're not saying cheating, um, we're just saying there's a, a pattern problem here. Um, that's the claim, uh, although it's, there's also a, a strong promise being made that this aligns with academic integrity. So there's a bit of having your cake and eat it too on these companies' um, marketing and messaging. But there was a more sort of, um, uh, pernicious and uh, particular problem with these systems than just sort of a generic problem of being monitored. And this was what ended up happening was a, a few months after these systems started um, being put into place, there was 
this concern specifically that students of color were being treated systematically differently um, than other students by the software. And in a particular sense, they were being treated because the facial detection algorithms, so the algorithms that would just detect the presence of a face, I'm not saying facial recognition to say, you know, this is Mike's face, but to say this is a face, um, the facial detection algorithms that would be looking at the visual scene to decide, is there a face there? Those visual detection algorithms, it was being observed anecdotally by a lot of investigative journalists that were talking to students. It was being observed that students of color were being flagged as having made academic violations more often than uh, other students. Um, because the facial detection algorithms had not been trained to be able to recognize faces of students of color. So there was a higher error rate. There was a greater false uh, positive of an academic violation rate. And in a sense, sort of the, the algorithm was less able to track the face of a student of color. And therefore, what was happening was that that was being flagged as an academic violation. So you've got this sort of canonical uh, classic problem of this, this technology is expecting a certain uh, input or sensory input, and it fails. It fails when that input is not, quote unquote, what it's, it, what it's expecting. Um, so this question arose, we started to see um, journalists, especially tech journalists, start to identify and say, wait a second, there might be some systematic racism built into these uh, systems, these detection systems, in addition to just, you know, the, the broad surveillance problem, they might be having, um, uh, treating students of color differently. So I was on a task force at our university, and we were specifically um, tasked by the provost with answering a question was, um, did the e-proctoring system that we used, did we have this problem? We, to, to be clear, and I want to hasten to, to say very clearly, we did not have reports of there being a systematic difference. We did not have complaints. We did not have sort of any patterns that we saw, but we were watching what was happening in the press. And there was a sort of a proactive move, I think, on, on our university's part to say, um, did our vendor, did our software have this problem? So this was the question that we were faced with. The reason I want to set this up sort of a little bit um, so strongly is to say, this was a problem, uh, this was a question that we were tasked with. And what I was curious about or sort of intrigued by and related to this moment is, how did we define the problem? How did we define what the problem was in relation to this algorithmically generated or driven question of were students of color faces recognized differently than other students? Um, so we saw, so we got this question of, so did we find it? Yes, uh, we, our vendor confirmed that the facial detection software that we were using had a higher rate of error for students of color. We had no evidence that there were differences. We, in some ways, um, identified it you know, relatively early. We also did an audit. We didn't see any um, violations of academic integrity in any sort of patterned way um, that were related to, to students of color or, or other students. We didn't see the evidence of this mistake that the software was making in our procedures. So that was... In some ways, um, we didn't see that, you know, translating into our institutional processes, but we still had to recommend do something. We had to say, what should we do as this task force? What should we recommend? Because the software, yes, was failing. The software was systematically identifying students differently. This is sort of the meat of what I wanted to get into is to say, where is this error exactly? And the reason that I want to use this as a, as a way of seeing error as an institutional problem is that it's a bunch of different places at once. So the, almost the simpler place, the simplest place is to see it as a technical error. This is something that a vendor would fix. They would update their training data sets. They would update their model. They would figure out a better sort of facial detection system. So one view was to say it was purely technical. That's there. Um, the, <laughs> another way of seeing the error though is in, uh, and this was some of the other software companies were claiming was to say, well, here's a way to fix the error is that students of color should actually illuminate themselves to make themselves more visible by the facial detection uh, algorithmic systems. Um, I can't see your faces, um, but to me, this was a, a, a utterly egregious recommendation. And it related to, if you don't know Simone Brown's uh, work on lamplighting laws um, in New York, on uh, the, ra the racist history of lamplighting laws, please get to know her work. Um, she basically describes, you know, one of the examples in her really wonderful book um, describes the law, this law that was um, African-Americans uh, living in New York would have to carry lamps with them 
so that they could be seen by law enforcement or by other uh, people living in New York, they would have to take responsibility for their own illumination, to take responsibility for their own surveillance by carrying lamps with them. And it was illegal for a person of color in New York to not, uh, or to, it was illegal to travel without a lamp that was there. To me, this is by telling students of color, well, just put a, a large spotlight on your face. Uh, we were telling them uh, to effectively do this again. We also sort of a problem of saying, well, this is a problem of pedagogy, um, because why are we using these timed standardized tests at all? Maybe that's part of the error. Why do we need these at all? We also have sort of an autonomy, perhaps, a, an autonomy dimension of this problem with the professors. Why do professors have this autonomy? There's good reasons to say they should. There's good reasons to perhaps say they shouldn't. Um, we also have this problem that's really much related to socioeconomic status of the students, for instance, under uh, the point B under equity. We knew that um, beyond the racial discrepancies and the racial uh, uh, discrimination that's happening here, a lot of students who were uh, living in places where they're sharing with multiple people on internet connection, or there's no way that they could create an environment that was free of sound, that was free, you know, that where their head wouldn't turn to look at something. So the software was already, you know, in addition to the racist aspects of it. The software was also assuming a particular type of test environment. Um, we also have this problem of the economics of the university. Why did we need these really large classes? There's something about the business model of the university that required or benefited from very large classes that could charge the same amount of tuition uh, for a large class versus a small class. We also had a concern of, so suppose our faculty were receiving reports of potential academic violations, where our faculty, um, sophisticated enough in understanding their own implicit biases that they would understand, wait a second, um, why am I seeing this pattern here? What's happening about it? And then we also had this issue of this, this you know, quote unquote brand issue that the university had. Um, so I'm gonna speed up a little. I, 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 I'll get, I'd love to get Q&A very, very soon. Um, so what did we do? So the, the provost, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm happy in the sense that we decided to discontinue the use of this respondus monitor. This is a uh, a letter that the provost um, wrote to the entire university community saying they were discontinuing the use of Respondus Monitor, which is the name of our um, software that was using the facial detection, because there were, quote, a number of concerns about fairness and privacy. Notice no mention of race, no mention of socioeconomic status, no mention. There was a, a bounding of the problem here. Um, working on modifying, enhancing the software. So we eventually stopped, we, you know, we stopped using that system, um, but we said we might use it in the future. Okay. Uh, and then it was found actually that it was unconstitutional to um, monitor students' rooms anyway, the uh, US federal judge found. Um, so to bring it in for landing here, and I wanna sort of say across these three systems, how can we think about algorithmic errors? And I'll, I'll go through this a little bit uh, quickly, but concisely, how can we think about algorithmic errors? So the first is that these are sort of, algorithmic errors are evidence of sociotechnical folk theories. They're accounts of how people think things are supposed to work. Algorithmic errors are also what Lakoff calls these sentinel apparatuses. Think about that United stock price drop, or think about the, the news stories um, that were uh, there. Um, there's sort of things that, that reveal particular kinds of failures. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, they're also sort of, I would say, normative diagnostics. They're sort of what people think counts as an error says a lot about how they invest in particular uh, moral and ethical imaginaries. That's what an algorithmic error can be. It can be a way to be to see what people are invested in. We also see that some algorithmic errors are sort of evidence, I would say, sort of thresholds of consequences. Not every error uh, got to be fixed. Think about the um, student monitoring example. There, were, I would argue there's still pretty strong elements of that error that have that are still in place in our university and in many universities. Um, so there's sort of a way to see what gets what's what's wrong enough to be considered part of the error. There's also a way to sort of see institutional missions. So Paolo and DiMaggio, wonderful new institutional sociologists, um, think about algorithms as sort of these loosely coupled arrays of standardized elements is the phrase they use. But their algorithmic errors are ways to see what institutions think their problems are. And finally, last thing I would say is that algorithmic errors also sort of show this power to define. So we know that some folk theories of algorithms tend to dominate more than others. You know, Some sentinel apparatuses are paid attention to more than others. Some normative moral orders um, have more weight um, than others. And some institutions are sort of more or less uh, changeable than others. 
So their algorithmic errors are everywhere. They're, they continue, keep looking <laughs> every day, you'll see more algorithmic errors. And what I want to end is, is, is this slide, and these are sort of some of the, the work that I've been drawing upon here. But if we think about algorithmic errors as public problems, we really need to move them out of the realm of them thinking about them as private or technical glitches or quirks that can be solved on the time frame or according to the, the problem frame of the people who are creating systems. We much more uh, could benefit from seeing algorithmic errors as public problems that are actually shared unavoidable consequences uh, of, of the sort of different sort of socio-technical systems that we're living in. Um, okay, sorry to rush the last little bit there. I will end there uh, to leave at least a little bit of time for us to have some questions. Apologies for going a bit over time, um, but I'd love to end there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. I was taking notes frantically the whole time and thinking of all the great research that has been emerging that um, has been highlighting algorithmic injustice and, and seeing a lot of it quoted here. Um, I, there are questions and I just want to sort of say one thing that was coming to mind too about the proctoring software is not just race, racist, um, not just the implication of a racial um, profiling, but also um, it got me thinking about disability and students who might be dealing with different forms of disability being um, falsely um, accused of potential uh, fraud or, or cheating in these situations. So it's, yeah. <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a re it's really good to see that, that these softwares are being questioned in this way. Yeah, and I, I would thank you for bringing that up because I would add to that, we have uh, neurodivergent students or students who are, um, you know, have different relationship to sensory inputs of different kinds. I had, when I was teaching online, many students who would say, you know, it's much better for me to turn my camera off because I, I learn better just through listening or I wanna be able to see captioning. There's a whole range um, of sort of different uh, abilities and, and literacies that uh, that these software just don't take into account in their judgments of quote plagiarism or, or uh, cheating. Yeah, and, and in each instance, we can think about the ways in which it's the already um, very marginalized and discriminated against communities within our society who are further uh, on the receiving end of discrimination within within these technical systems. So so thank you for, for highlighting all of this. So our first question um, is a very relevant topic. Um, what are your thoughts about chat GPT detecting? <laughs> Given that they are predictors, um, yeah. how can we ever know if there if there really occurred an error, especially when students deny it? Yeah, no, it's a, it's as I was preparing this, yeah, to see the chat GPT and and the sort of the the race between, you know, the synthetically generated content and then the systems to detect the synthetically generated content and then the back and forth and you see this race that's there. Um, yeah, I mean, I I I think my my overarching attitude is one is we need to do a lot better work and this is part of the knowing machines work that I that I do with uh with the team at USC and NYU and, and in Europe um is to think about how first how synthetic media systems are built sort of what kinds of training data goes into them what kinds of models who are the cultures of production that create the systems and then similarly the systems built to you know quote unquote detect the presence of generative AI or synthetic media um, how are those detection systems built? So, so one answer is to sort of look at the cultures of production for these systems and the systems that detect the systems and ask what kinds of assumptions um, or thresholds or definitions or categories or labels and sort of trying to understand the politics and the political economy of that uh, categorization work and that system building work. That's sort of, to me, that's one place uh, that I think we, we need to get good at fast, you know, and it's it's fast um, in understanding this. The other is sort of thinking about the social contexts of where these technologies are deployed or the sense making that happens there. In our university, we we have sort of this bifurcation of some people trying to, you know, lock it down, and we have to make cheating detection systems get even better at figuring out whether students are using it. And I've I've never used the you know the turn it in, which is the one we have. I've never I haven't use that partly because I don't like I don't like the relationship that I have with students if it's mediated through this 
this plagiarism detection thing. And then I get this little score that tells me, you know, the probability of them being a cheater. And I don't, so I, it's more about my relationship with my students. And I acknowledge that honestly, yes, some of my students may be using these systems. And that is a, that's a choice that I have. I fortunately have the autonomy to say, I don't want to use that because I want to have that relationship exist, um, you know, in my conversations with students. And I, I don't think you're ever going to sort of prevent that. And then the third thing I would say is that what I've done with my students is actually acknowledge that they might be using, you know, chat GPT or other generators. And I have them edit the text that comes out. So I say, let's generate it together. Let's like give it a prompt. What's a good prompt? What's a bad prompt? What's the text that resulted? And then we have them sort of edit and iterate on that. And the act of iterating on an automatically generated answer, you you need to know stuff about the content, about the phenomenon in order to be able to edit. So I would either, you know, use that as a as sort of a pedagogical move to say, uh, let's meet it head on and 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 work with it. So those are the three classes of buckets of answer, but I, I don't know the answers yet. It's no, I, ironically, I had a colleague create a, a chat, cheap, chat GPT profile of me by <laughs> <laughs> CV um, sort of to demonstrate something in class, but took my name out of it. It was actually interesting, but of course, it's very generic. So without yeah. having done that additional work, you can't get very far. Right. Um, so our next question, could you say more about what you think could or should be done about algorithmic bias? As you and others have outlined, algorithms are often clearly biased in pretty problematic ways. But what can be done about this? Do we try to train software engineers better, develop regulations about algorithms, make users of the algorithms more aware of their biases, <laughs> some combination of these or something else entirely? Yeah, I... I, I, I like the question. I appreciate the question. I think for me, the word bias is, doesn't quite capture what I think the power of the phenomenon is. I would much more think about um, questions of justice and fairness. And uh, I, I would point to um, um, Anna Hoffman has written some really wonderful work on thinking about sort of the limits of fairness and justice as, as a discourse and bias, especially as a, as a word. Because in some ways, you know, uh, an answer is to say, yes, you know, there's a lot of power inequalities and, you know, various kinds of um, injustices that are happening. And if you just sort of try to interrogate the algorithms for their bias and then fix the bias by changing the training data or having, you know, like in the, the facial detection system, uh, some people said, well, oh, well, then you make the system better by having a whole bunch of faces in the training data. So you should have students of color in the training data because then the system will be less biased. And I, so in one sense, okay, yes, that is a quote, less biased system because it's treating students of color and other students equally. But I wanna say, hold on, let's back up a second and say, we're just making surveillance systems better. I, don't, I like that the, to me sort of misses the point of um, having a conversation about you know the the power of socio-technical systems. So, I I'm less invested in making all systems less biased. I'm more interested in thinking about the power of systems in various social and cultural sense making and meaning making and systems of inequality and thinking about you know what is it that what what really is the right uh, sort of justice move to make. Um, I don't know. I don't want to necessarily make a surveillance system better for um, for people who are already marginalized um, in all different kinds of ways. That doesn't seem like the right move. So, um. thank you. Um, great. We have a few more questions here. So next, are you familiar with the fraud detection systems used by state and federal agencies who determine eligibility for public benefits? If so, can you speak to that generally? I so I I got to say I'm not familiar enough with the details of those systems. Um, so I, I I really can't say something specific. I think the more general thing that I would offer is to say, again, interrogate the cultures of production. That's the phrase I go back to: is go look at the cultures of and the socio-technical cultures of production. So, what counts as a violation in those systems, and what counts as um, patterns that are thresholds of error in those systems 
um, again, those are the things I would look to without knowing. And, uh, but I think the same is true for there's, uh, especially in the US, the criminal sentencing um, algorithms that are used as well. When you look at, you know, rates of recidivism, um, a lot of those algorithmic systems have, I, I would argue, sort of racist assumptions built into the cultures of production that made them. So um, I would look to what are the logics and cultures and, and you know, training data and values and vendors and people and funding that goes into making those systems and systems of labor. Um, my, my gut says there's a general phenomenon of um, those kinds of inequalities continually getting baked into the, those cultures of production. Right, right. Thank you very much for that. We have two more questions if you have time for them. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Great. Um, a follow up. Um, apologize. This was this came later, so I don't exactly know what it's a follow up to. Okay. Um, the injection attacks on Bing's AI Sydney points to some deeper issues with the corpus it was trained on. Might we see the errors detected in the injection attack, including Sydney's claim that it was fake news, as a larger sentinel of trends in media and language on which it was trained? Oof. Yeah. So I don't. I, I got to say, I don't know enough about the details about that particular system, but the thing I would pull out of that would be to say uh, a focus on the training data, I think, is super important. And again, this is the this is the primary focus of this of the knowing machines uh, group that I'm that I'm part of with Jason Schultz and Kate Crawford and several other people um, where we're trying to look at, again, the cultures that produce training data that um, bound training data that categorize the different um, uh, sort of features of training data that think about when is training data good, you know, quote unquote, good enough to be deployed into a model, into a system, um, when are training data um, data sets redacted, when are they, when are they pulled back and, and the sort of the impossibility of pulling a training data set back. So there's a big, big messy space of training data set cultures that we're trying to focus on in that project. So I, I, I would agree. I don't know the details of that exact question, but I would say that's what I take away from is a, a need to double down on a interrogation of the training data sets. Yeah, and it's so hard to 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 define what a good training data set would be when it's emerging from a cultural and societal space that is really entrenched with within white supremacy and colonialism and sexism and homophobia and you know just yeah. so many forms of oppression. Um, and some of that's living in private companies. So the training data that are are publicly available that we might know about versus training data that are actually injections among multiple training data sets are combined in these sort of Frankenstein-like approaches, a lot of those living in proprietary private systems that we don't have access to and likely will not have access to. And yet those are presented as sort of like, it's just the model. It's There's this air of neutrality given to those systems without understanding um, how they were made. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, wonderful. Okay, so the next question, your pushback against our tendency to blame or push individuals to change when they don't fit within an algorithmic system is very refreshing. Could you say more about what algorithmic errors matter for public solution and debate might look like? Are there ideal civic mechanisms to address these challenges? Oh, that's such a great question. And that's kind of like, in a way, that's if I had the answer to that question, then I would be done with this work, but I'm, <laughs> right. I'm, not, I'm not done with this work. Um, so no, that is the right animating question. I think the the the, the way into that is I'm, I continue to go back to, um, and I, I left it quickly, but the last slide, there's some writing on sort of where do public problems come from? I'm, in, I'm inspired by, there's this book, Joseph Gusfield's book, um, The Culture of Public Problems, uh, he was writing. And there's this great journal called Social Problems, which has a wonderful archive that goes back many years. But this question that, uh, of where do public problems come from? I really, I, I keep getting, I geek out on like that question of how are they made? So Joseph Gusfield wrote this book on basically a notion of impaired impaired driving or quote unquote drunk driving or buzz driving. Um, that type of driving used to be a private problem that was you know a problem in the home or a problem of the individual or a problem with a, a bar or a drinking establishment. It was sort of like, those people should fix it. The transition from impaired driving to being a private problem to a public problem that would then have regulation, that would have design around it, that would have campaigns around it, that that transition, I think, I look to history to sort of say, when were moments when we actually got to um, be 
creative and constructive and critical about the creation of, and I, with my Dewey hat on here, I would say of, of publicly shared consequences. These are consequences you cannot extract yourself from. That's a, to me, that's a public problem. Public problems are when you cannot extract yourself from those consequences. That's what I think we're at the ba baby, baby steps of in thinking about algorithmic problems. Because you still hear people say, you know, well, if you, you know, don't like, you know, the, the racist or sexist results of a search engine or a algorithm, don't use it. Like, don't use, there's still this, this response of like, just don't use the system. Um, I don't even try to live your life without using any algorithmic system. Good luck. I mean, <laughs> it's really hard to avoid systems. I would say then those are those are publicly shared consequences. I realistically, even though uh, my colleague and friend Janet Vertesi has wonder has done wonderful work on trying, try to live your life in a way that does not touch a Google infrastructure, like writ large. Try to uh, try to navigate the world without it. I don't think that's possible. So that's sort of a that's a public utilities question, but I think it goes beyond a public utilities framing of social media platforms. I think it goes to uh, a public problems framing, um, and that's what I, sorry, long answer, but that's what I sort of try to think about is, is where do public problems come from in this space? Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Thank you so much, and thank you, Connie, for asking it. We have one more that came in, so okay. I might say this is our final question. Okay, okay, okay. Do you have any thoughts on the ability of algorithms to further financial inequality? I'm thinking here about hedge funds with access to algorithms used to predict market trends in order to create and sustain wealth and the ways this technology further privileges those in positions of financial power. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I I, I don't have a lot other else to say other than to say yes. That is a I think that is yet another, yet another domain where sort of a seemingly neutral objective, you know, it's quote, it's just a tool to help predict uh, market behaviors. Those tools available to, you know, people either with wealth or privilege or power to be able to use those tools, it becomes this cyclical thing where if you've got access to those tools, you earn more wealth and power to, to then use those tools. And it becomes, um, I know, uh, you know, in the US for sure, you know, the question of, the the tax return system. So you know, if you have access to um, you know good strong lawyers and accountants um, to be able to navigate a really complicated and needlessly complicated tax return system and IRS system, um, you can effectively kind of opt out of a lot of taxation. Folks, poorer folks, uh, especially people of color, without and in socioeconomic statuses without access to those, are often beholden to you know, rules that they can't figure out how to get around or or don't have the the power, the privilege to be able to find the loopholes. So I think that kind of inequality is 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 absolutely present in the financial systems for sure. And and again, that's why I would say it's a public problem. It's a problem problem because you cannot, it's not about me choosing to have access to those systems or not. Um, there's something structural that's driving that that impact. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. These are great questions. Fantastic. Yeah, it was yeah. such a stimulating presentation. I'm sure everybody who was here today is going to be thinking about this all day. These are very much, we are living with them every day. We can't ignore them. Our governments can't ignore them. Um, so thank you so much. Um, it was an honor to host the Q&A with you. Um, and just have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jada. All right. Take care. Bye.